Joining us now from Edinburgh is Stuart Hosey. He's the deputy leader of the Scottish National Party. Thank you for being with us, Mr Hosey. Uh, can you understand why the rest of the UK outside Scotland might be rather uh, afraid of a party which says that it would put Scotland's interests first always, voting on matters affecting people in England uh, or Wales or Northern Ireland? Well, I can certainly understand why David Cameron would be... Um a little cross of a progressive political party winning a large number of uh, votes and seats perfectly democratically uh, tried to have its policies implemented which were uh, the opposite of the austerity measures of the Tories and indeed the Liberals in the last Parliament. But I think many people south of the border, in Wales and in Northern Ireland, might be quite taken with the SNB's approach of actually ending austerity rather than carrying on the pain of 30 billion more cuts for another five years. But your interest is the best interest of Scotland, not the best interest of the people elsewhere, isn't it? Well, I, I, we don't think these two things are separate. I mean, we've argued for a long time now that, say, for the north of England, a strong, booming Scottish economy would be a boon to people in Newcastle. Imagine if you're a business in the north of England and 80% of a booming, prosperous Scotland, the population and the businesses, are within an hour of where you operate from compared to the four or five hour haul to London. Uh, we think a strong, booming, prosperous Scotland would be of benefit to the north of England. And in the way in which the package described and Nicola will lay out tomorrow, there are things which can actually practically be done to rebalance the economy across the whole of the UK, not just to Scotland's benefit, but to the benefit of people in many, many parts uh, of the islands. But how would you implement that in practical terms? How would it work in terms of getting laws through the Westminster Parliament? Well, uh, let's give one example. If we, uh, the polls are right and our substantial lead is translated into votes in a hung Parliament uh, p position, if there was a minority Labour administration which needed our help in order to get their legislation through, we might well make a case for saying, look, let's not have HS2 go to Manchester and Birmingham, uh, let's have it start in Edinburgh or Glasgow coming through Newcastle as well so we have a joint up high-speed rail network across the whole of the island to the benefit of everybody, not just those travelling uh, from Birmingham to the south. And what about the money, the per capita money flowing from uh, the Treasury? I mean, there again, uh, you want to maintain a system where disproportionate amounts of money goes to Scotland. That wouldn't benefit poor people in Newcastle or Leeds, would it? Uh, well, of course, that's only part of the equation. It's true that spending in Scotland is higher. There's no question about that. Uh, not higher than London. London's actually higher than Scotland. But, of course, our tax yield uh, has been higher per head, I think, for the last 34 years. So that balances out over the piece. Indeed, I think for the large part of the last 30-odd years, our fiscal position has actually been better than that of the whole of the UK. But this isn't about Scotland getting more. Uh, this is about fair play and making sure we deliver not just for Scotland, uh, but for people throughout the island as well. I mean, I appreciate what you say about not uh, supporting a Conservative uh, government, a minority government, but the historical record does show that the Scottish National Party have been able to work with the Tories in the past, doesn't it? And there could be circumstances where you would prefer to see a Tory government in London than uh, a Labour one. No, I mean, we've been really clear. We're an anti-Tory party, we're an anti-austerity party. We've made an offer to Ed Miliband that if there's a majority of non-Tory MPs, we can lock the Tories out of power. And I have to say, when I hear some Labour figures say there'll be no deal under any circumstances, I do wonder sometimes if they're serious, because we certainly wouldn't expect to see Ed Miliband hand the keys to Downing Street back to David Cameron. But, but, I think if the polls are right, if it's a hung parliament, a minority Labour administration, uh, there's every opportunity for us to strike a deal, either a confidence and supply arrangement or a vote-by-vote -vote basis, where we can try to bring our progressive policies to bear, not just in the benefits of Scotland, but it would be, but also for many, many others. Uh, I think large numbers of people throughout the UK would love to see a real end to austerity. They would like the SNP to vote to keep the NHS in public hands, all of that, I think, yeah. is very sensible and, I suspect, in England, very popular as well. But the irony of all that is, is while, understandably, it's perfectly legitimate, you want to replace Labour in Scotland, 
by saying that you want to work with them in the rest of the country, you're actually playing to David Cameron's hands because the fear of people in the rest of the country of the SNP involvement might actually drive them to vote for David Cameron. That's certainly what he's hoping. Well, I think that's wrong, and certainly from the messages I've had and many colleagues have had, there seems to be a demand for the SNP to actually stand in England. The positions we're putting forward are extremely popular indeed, and I don't believe for a single second uh, people will be driven into the hands of the Tories down south simply because the SNP are poised to do well in Scotland and to deliver popular policies uh, throughout the UK. Stuart Hersey, thank you for joining us from Edinburgh. Well, speaking of